welcome to our audience and a special welcome to tonight's guests, the amazing Susan Glasser and Peter Baker, and of course, to the always wonderful Madeline Brand. America at a Crossroads is a joint venture between Jews United for Democracy and Justice and Community Advocates, Inc. Thanks as always to our leadership team, which in addition to me, includes David Lehrer, former Congressman Mel Levine, Zeb Yaroslavsky, Rabbi Ken Chazen, and Caroline Kelly. As always, we have some amazing programs coming up. Next week, we will broach a subject, Crime in America, which occupies the front pages of most papers on a daily basis and definitely creates grist for the political mill. Next week, we will welcome two of the country's most seasoned law enforcement professionals to help us separate fact from fiction to gain a better understanding of just how significant a problem crime actually is in America. LA Police Chief Michael Moore and Bill Bratton, who is the former Boston as well as New York City Police Commissioner and former Chief of Police of LA as well. They will separate myth from reality as we talk about crime in America and how it impacts our democracy. They will be in conversation with the always incisive and highly celebrated Pat Morrison. The following week, we are very excited to present the renowned documentary filmmaker Ken Burns and his colleagues, Lynn Novick and Sarah Botstein, whose recent PBS three-part documentary, The U.S. and the Holocaust, has swept the country and been widely reviewed to popular and critical acclaim. The filmmakers will be in conversation with the exceptional Rabbi Sharon Browse, founding rabbi of ECAR, who was named number one influential rabbi by Newsweek and the Daily Beast. We do have closed captioning, and if you need information, um, if you need information about how I guess my video was off, sorry about that. If you need information about how to use closed captioning, we will put it in the, uh, in the chat in a moment. Thank you for all of your donations. We really appreciate them. They keep these programs coming. And be sure when you register not to uncheck boxes. Uh, otherwise you won't get any of our communications, including our Zoom link. So uh, it's good to see you all. Now I would like to introduce my friend and colleague, David Lair. Thank you, Janice. It's great to have you back. Tonight will be an exciting one. We'll hear from the authors of a 700 page Trump history that the Washington Post has described as the most comprehensive and detailed account of the Trump presidency yet published. It's, a, it's terrific to have Peter and Susan back with us once again. After the two programs that Janice has noted, on November 9th, we'll host the Washington Post Max Boot. Max is not only an award-winning historian and expert on Russia and Ukraine, He's also a widely read columnist who's written extensively about the sorrowful impact of Trump on our politics. And he has a fascinating piece about the widely ignored, ignored progress in Middle East relations in this Monday's post and a terrific column, column on Putin's multiple missteps in today's post. The following week on Tuesday, November 15th, again, that's a Tuesday, not our usual Wednesday, we'll partner with NPR station KPCC to present a post-mortem on the midterm elections. It'll be a two hour program broadcast as usual via Zoom, but it will also be a live in-person program for those in Southern California who'd like to attend at the Skirbold Center in West LA. Among our guests will be Pulitzer Prize winning columnist Clarence Page, NPR's Mara Eliason, and they will analyze the national scene. The second hour will focus on California with UCLA Sonia Diaz, Pepperdine's Dean of Public Policy, Pete Peterson, and Loyola Marymount's Fernando Guerra and also NPR's Frank Stoltz. Larry Mantle, who's been our host many times, will be the moderator for both hours. We urge those planning to attend the live session to register as soon as possible because space is limited. You'll receive the information on how to do all the logistics and how to register in the post-program email mm -hmm. that Janice sends every week right after this broadcast. Now to moderate tonight's discussion, KCR's wonderful Madeline Brand. Madeline is the host of KCRW's Press Play, a daily program of news and culture. She also hosts the Legal Eagle Files. She's reported for NPR nationally and locally for over 30 years and is one of our favorites. Madeline? Thank you, David. Thank you, Janice. It's so great to be back. I'm so happy to be with you all again. And just, uh, I wanna apologize in advance. I have a little bit of a cold, a little bit under the weather, so I may cough or sneeze, but I'll mute myself, I promise and um, it's not COVID, so it could be worse. Um, it, it really is my pleasure to welcome Susan Glasser of The New Yorker and Peter Baker of The New York Times, authors of The Divider. This is the first book to chronicle the entire first 
and only, maybe, question mark, presidential term of Donald Trump. This is the third book they have written together. Their previous books were The Man Who Ran Washington about the legendary Republican Chief of Staff and Secretary of State James Baker. Also, Kremlin Rising, Vladimir Putin's Russia and the End of Revolution. And as they recount in this book, at the very end of the book, in November of 2016, they were about to start new assignments in Israel when the presidential election turned out differently than anyone had expected. So Susan sent Peter an email that election night or maybe early morning or late morning, late early morning, that said, uh, do you want to come back to D.C. for Trump? I think it was that brief. And a few weeks later, Peter rejoined Susan in Washington to cover a presidency like no other. I welcome them now to discuss what they've learned. Thank you, Mal. Thank you for having us, Janice, and the whole team there, David. It's a great uh, honor to be with you guys tonight. Yeah, thanks so much. It's uh, it's this is a great group, and uh, you know we're glad that it sprung up out of the pandemic. Well, we're so glad to have you back. And I just want to begin uh, at the beginning of your book, and you write that. In order to understand January 6, 2021, you need to understand January 20, 2017 and all the days in between. And you begin your book. It's really an extraordinary uh, book because I just it's such a page turner. Every page has some insane anecdote. But you begin hours into his presidency when uh, Trump strides into the Oval Office and he seems to be not at all overwhelmed by his place in history in this storied room. Um, instead, he's most consumed with the room's lighting and how he looks in that lighting and how his hair looks in that lighting. So I'm wondering how that anecdote really, for you, why you chose to begin the book with this anecdote, how it really sets up not only the book, but the entire four years of his presidency. Yeah, I think that's a great, uh, great way to be this discussion too, because I think it really tells you a little bit about Donald Trump, right? When he comes to the Oval Office for that first time, he has never spent a day in public office or in the military, the first president we've had who has no experience in either of those um, services. And I think that his, his, his initial reaction to the Oval Office, oh my gosh, how do they get the lighting to do that, tells you a lot about how he had gotten there, because he was all about creating uh, creating legends, creating, you know, reality through 14 years of The Apprentice, through many years at real estate developer and businessman. He was always about branding himself, always about creating a name for himself, always about the image and the legend of this great businessman. Of course, we all know now, uh, and we probably should have known then, that he, in fact, had a much more checkered past if you look at his record, multiple bankruptcies, uh, thousands of lawsuits from people he uh, who, who accused him of not paying them, uh, any number of business failures. So I think that what you saw in that moment when he arrives in the Oval Office is somebody who's not thinking about history, not thinking about the burden of the office or the, the responsibility he's about to assume, but how to create this image that he wants to create for the next four years. Right. And so it, it really is image over substance. Did he have any policy ideas? Did he have any goals um, from that point of view? Or, or was it simply for power for power's sake? Yeah, that that is a gets at the heart of it because you know really Trump, the word transactional was used an awful lot throughout his presidency and correctly so. Uh, Trump is not an ideological figure, although he uh, promoted an ideology at times. He certainly hired many people who had ideological agendas. He has a worldview in some ways, right? That's very consistent going all the way back to say the '80s when he first came into the public. Uh, sphere. Uh, but uh, having a worldview is not the same thing as having uh, policy goals when you're in office. Donald Trump, uh, you know, go go back and look at this incredible 1990 Playboy magazine interview. Uh, and you'll you'll see the Donald Trump who uh, decades later became president. He's talking about how our allies are screwing us. He's talking about protectionism. He's lamenting the fact that, uh, you know, leaders uh, of the United States weren't as tough as leaders in authoritarian countries. So it's all kind of there uh, to be laid out. But Trump at different points was a member of, I think, you know, five different parties, Democrat, then Republican, then Democrat, Reform Party. Uh, he was pro-choice before he was anti-abortion. Uh, and so it's, it, it's his goal was never about ideology. Uh, it was always about Donald Trump, uh, the man himself. And that is why he ran 
for office. I think that's pretty well documented that that was his goal uh, was both to promote himself and you know his business interests. And uh, then when he sort of became the you know the the dog who caught the fire engine, <laughs> uh, you know he he immediately reverts to that Trumpian playbook, you know, right? This is a guy who's already in his 70s. He's not going to change and suddenly become a serious student of policy. Uh, you know, what he is was a serious uh, and in some ways a genius marketer and promoter of himself. Yeah. And and he liked the chaos that he brought to the whole institution, hence the title of the book. Uh, he, he loved uh, he had a chaotic campaign and he brought that right into the White House. He created all these rivalries or he sat back and watched all these rivalries happen. How did that serve him to have all these people, uh, you know, attacking each other? Reince Priebus versus Steve Bannon versus Jared Kushner versus Kellyanne Conway versus you name it. What would he do? Just sit back and let it happen and and hope that the the strongest pit bull emerged yeah. I mean, he was basically like a wild world of wrestling federation, you know, junkie uh, reproduced there in the West Wing. I mean, that is why we call the book The Divider. Not that every politician on some level is about division at some point. You have to win elections by making a contrast. You say my program is better than their program. My character is better than their character. But Donald Trump made, a, a, you know, a, 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 a mastery of division, not just during a campaign, but throughout his four years. Other presidents believed at least there was the ostensible uh, purpose of the presidency to bring people together, right? You know, Barack Obama said there's not a red America and a blue America, but a United States of America. And you saw George W. Bush said he wanted to be a uniter, not a divider. Well, that was not Donald Trump. In fact, Steve Bannon, his chief ideologist, said pretty closely after the election, said, we didn't win this election, he said, to bring the country together. That was not their goal. Trump himself said, I like conflict. I like to see people fight around me. And that was the way he governed. He got, he divided not just America, but as you put it, he put divided his own White House, his own party, at times even his own family. So how did he pro put his family in, in power in the White House? Who did he favor? Uh, you know, it's widely believed that he, Ivanka was his favorite. Um, he even said that he seriously wanted to have her as his running mate in 2016. Um, and had to be talked out of that multiple times, correct? Yeah, I mean, that is an amazing thing. I, I have to say, it was only when we went back and worked on the book that I realized uh, at the time that we had just discounted that. But, you know, it turns out, in fact, that Trump was serious uh, about Ivanka as his running mate. And actually, he kept bringing it up so much that his campaign advisors in 2016, who had, like, the rest of us, you know, just thought that was absurd. Uh, he forced them to take it seriously enough that they even had to put her name on one of their internal uh, polls that they paid for. And then we're kind of chagrined when it turned out that she was testing better than some of the actual candidates for vice president. And in this case, as well as later on in the presidency, it was Ivanka herself who had to sort of you know, be the the grown up one and say, well, dad, you know, like, no, I can't be the vice president. And actually later in the presidency, uh, again, I think many people might have discounted this and just thought it was not real. But our reporting suggests that it was real, that Donald Trump seriously considered appointing Ivanka Trump, obviously wildly unqualified to be either the president of the World Bank. I mean, I'm serious here, the president of the World Bank or the US ambassador to the United Nations. And I mean, you know, Donald Trump ran a family business his whole career. Uh, and he, he, he basically thought he was gonna treat the presidency of the United States in the same way. Uh, and so both uh, his son-in-law, Jared Kushner and Ivanka were officially on the White House staff uh, and given more power and a broader portfolio, certainly in Kushner's case, than really uh, there's any precedent for. Uh, obviously, Robert Kennedy was probably the closest analogy in modern times, but he was a, a Senate confirmed, uh, a cabinet official in, as attorney general, obviously also had a lot more experience uh, in every possible way than Jared Kushner did, uh, who had never served uh, in government or anywhere outside of his own uh, family run company and uh, his advice to Trump in the 2016 campaign. It's, it's, it's a remarkable part of the story, although we can talk about this more. Really, what I didn't fully appreciate until Peter and I went back to write this was how much in 2020 uh, that began to fray. And you have this uh, interesting 
kind of emergence of the new axis between Donald Trump Jr. and 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 Donald Trump as Don Jr. is facilitating and you know egging on his father's wild post-election conspiracy theories and lies. Right, because you see Ivanka actually testifying before the January 6th committee. I don't believe Don Jr. testified. That's right. That's right. No, exactly. Don Jr. was egging on his father, sending a text to chief of staff saying, you know, laying out, in fact, the plan that ultimately was put into place, which is let's have uh, let's deny the electors for Joe Biden so we can find a way to either replace them through state legislatures or have the House uh, declare uh, Trump the vin winner. And Ivanka, by con contrast, and Jared Kushner basically washed their hands of it. They Once they decided the election was over, which they decided a lot longer, a lot earlier than her father did, they were busy thinking about their next life. Two days after the election, Jared Kushner wakes up in their home in Washington and says to Ivanka, you know, hey, we're moving to Miami. And they start making plans. They buy a $32 million property that used to be owned by Julio Iglesias, while Rudy Giuliani is busy telling the president of the United States that he actually won and can change the election. And rather than fight Rudy Giuliani, they basically said, we're out of here. And they left the field to the conspiracy theorists and allowed them, in effect, to take control in those last weeks, which I, which leads you to where you finally get on January 6th. So uh, I guess Donald Trump wasn't really looking toward to Ivanka anymore for counsel or, or Jared, for that matter. So was it transactional with them as well that he would yeah. only... I don't think Donald Trump listens to anyone's counsel, just to be clear. I think that he, uh, you know, believes that there's a certain trust uh, that exists inside family, even among family members who might hate each other, uh, as Trump him, perhaps himself did growing up uh, in the shadow of his father, uh, you know, in the company that, you know, later became the Trump organization. Uh, so, you know, he's kind of a believer in family, but not necessarily, uh, I don't think there's much uh, to suggest that Trump really listens to the count of anybody. Now, he he doesn't know necessarily a lot about how government works, or, you know, he he certainly was easily manipulatable and guided uh, by many officials in the course of his time in the White House because he was not familiar, you know, with when many of the subjects. And, and Kushner was given a wide array of portfolios, everything from uh, you know, the COVID response to Middle East peace at various points, China, Mexico, uh, you know, so in some ways, right, they they, they joked uh, at the beginning of the presidency that, that Kushner was the secretary of everything uh, because Trump kept handing him so many assignments. Uh, but in the end, uh, right, you know, it, it's just Donald Trump. Loyalty is a one-way yeah. What they discovered was that they actually couldn't, you know, a lot of people go to Jared and Ivanka and appeal to them to go to the president and stop him from doing this crazy thing or that crazy thing or to get him to do something that they felt was responsible. And they did that at first only to learn that they weren't being successful all the time, too. So they they stopped doing that. They, they husbanded their, you know, her, their efforts and, and, and only did it when they thought they had something they could really accomplish. Jared Kushner actually came up with a formula. For how to deal with his father-in-law. He knew that his father-in-law would be explosive if given bad news. So he actually came up with a formula, a two-to-one formula. If he had to give him bad news, he would give him twice as much good news first in order to soften the bad news. He had a two-to-one formula. In fact, he also told him to add five points, any poll number for Trump, just to kind of like tell him, you're, you're actually doing better than, than, than they say you are. Don't worry about it. But ultimately, Trump, in fact, told other aides that he just assumed they left. I mean, he he told other aides basically, you know, it would be better if Ivanka and Jared left Washington, went back up to New York. He didn't want them around at times. So there, there were real complications in this very dysfunctional White House. You spent a lot of time in the book talking about his relationship with the military. Um, and on the one hand, Trump really idolizes the military. He wants a big, huge parade like he saw in France when he was visiting uh, for commemorations of for World War I, I believe. Um, and yet at the same time, he calls his generals effing losers. Um, and he he really denigrates them to, his to their face in front of others, uh, shockingly. And I guess I'm wondering how he, what he wanted exactly from his generals. Did he want complete obedience and was he shocked to find out that they weren't going to give it to him? Yeah, that's such a great and important question. Um, you know, from the very beginning, as you said, Trump sort of had this, um, 
you know, kind of fixation even on the military uh, for a man for whom the word strong and strength is probably the highest compliment, certainly in public life, uh, you know, what better physical representation of strong than the US military, the world's most powerful. And he gravitated towards these kind of big burly men with, you know, a chest full of medals on inauguration day, January 20th, 2017. He brags in fact about what he calls quote, my generals. Uh, you know, Jim Mattis, the retired four-star Marine general who was a defense secretary, John Kelly, who started out as a DHS secretary and then became his second chief of staff. Uh, you know, Trump had this vision of them as, you know, sort of the representations of, you know, making America strong again. But of course, he had no real clue. Uh, he, he literally, his favorite movie was Patton. And, uh, you know, he really seemed to have this kind of like made for movie or TV vision of generals who would just sort of salute and, you know, like, you know, lay waste uh, to whatever territory Trump told them to lay waste to. And so I think the culture clash started almost right away. Uh, and he, uh, you know, there's this great scene in the book, in fact, uh, uh, the very first situation room meeting of the Trump presidency in January of 2017. Uh, and the, the advisors gather around the table, national security advisors in, in the situation room. There's only one holdover from the Obama era. That's the chairman of the Joint Chiefs at that time, uh, General Joseph Dunford, uh, another Marine four-star general. And, uh, you know, they are supposed to be telling Trump about all the, you know, kind of walking around the world and filling him in on the problems that he now is going to be dealing with. And it's a disaster. Uh, and, uh, you know, Trump immediately is sort of like not listening to them. And in fact, he's like rambling, oh, South Korea, you know, you wouldn't believe how much money they're charging my hotels for their televisions and things like that. He's complaining so much. And it's so bad that finally Reince Priebus, the first chief of staff, cuts off the meeting. And he asks a bunch of the, the principals to go up to his office and figure out what the heck to do. Uh, and they go up there and Dunford is trying, you know, who's, by the way, has seen presidents up close ever since, uh, you know, Bill Clinton. He tries to reassure this new team and he says, well, don't worry about it. You know, he's new. Once we have a better idea of what the Trump doctrine is for the world, we'll, we'll be able to handle this. And Jared Kushner cuts him off, you know, at all of 34 years old at the time or 36. And he says, you know, no. General, that's not how this is going to work. Uh, you know, Donald Trump isn't going to change. You know, it's it's never going to be any different. And actually, of course, Kushner was right. So this culture class with the generals began really from the beginning. But to your question, what did he want? Probably the most telling slash horrifying anecdote in the book, uh, you know, is a conversation that Trump had with John Kelly very early on in Kelly's tenure as White House chief of staff, in which he literally says, well, you know, you generals are fucking losers. And, you know, why can't you be more like the German generals? And Kelly says, what? What are you talking about? And Trump says, you know, like the generals in World War II, the Nazi generals. And uh, he basically says, well, they were totally loyal to Hitler. Why can't you be like that? And Kelly says, well, what are you talking about? You know, they tried to kill Hitler three times. But of course, <laughs> Trump didn't know that. And it's just, it's so revealing and, and, and very scary, obviously. So the word fascist has been uh, used a lot. Um, and I'm wondering if where you come down on this, when you put together an anecdote like that and all of your reporting, is, is Trump a proto-fascist? And did he come at this with that in mind? As you say, he doesn't know much about history. So I don't know how much he would know about fascist leaders of the past. Yeah. Well, I'll leave labels to others. I think that you could say, though, he certainly brings an authoritarian, almost autocratic view of the office to it, right? And you can define it however you think makes sense. He, he, the people he admired the most, the ones he Maybe. talked about with great reverence, were the autocrats of the world, were the, you know, the, the you know, the, the proto-fascists of the world, like Vladimir Putin, like Erdogan in Turkey, like Xi Jinping in China, or Kim Jong-un in North Carolina, or Sisi in Duterte. North Carolina, North, <laughs> sorry, North Korea, not North Carolina. We love North Carolina. The um, it was it was his, you know, 
fixation on them that caused a lot of people to think, in fact, that he obviously wanted to be more like them. And you heard him talk like that at times. I was on Air Force One with him once coming back from a summit meeting in Buenos Aires. He had just had dinner with Xi Jinping of China. And he was talking great with great envy about how Xi Jinping didn't have to basically have courts to worry about or you know a Congress or any other checks or balances on the power. If he wanted to execute somebody because they violated Chinese law, he could do it like that. And you could hear in that conversation, and he said things like this again and again, this idea that he ought to be able to have absolute power. That was a word he liked to use, absolute, right? I've got an Article 2 absolute, which, of course, is not what Article 2 of the Constitution says. In fact, the Constitution is very clear that this is shared power between three branches of government. A president's power is extensive, but it's not uh, unilateral. And that was something he never really fully accepted, it, no matter how many times people told him that. The generals told him, for instance, when he wanted to bomb Iranian missile sites inside of Iran with no provocation, that that would be illegal, that they didn't have the legal authority to do that. We would be tried as war criminals and the Hague, said one of his generals. That didn't stop him at times because he kept bringing up these ideas again and again. Hmm. Right. Like he he suggested shooting uh, immigrants at the southern border in the legs, no. right? Yeah, and I and there are so many examples of that. Not only did he suggest shooting immigrants at the southern border, but he repeatedly would demand that his officials do things that were blatantly illegal, like shut down the southern border entirely. You can't just wave your magic president wand and do that in our system. He was told that it would not be legal, uh, and yet he brought it up again and again and again. One time when he was trying to get senior officials of the Department of Homeland Security to do what he wanted, and they were resisting by saying it was illegal, he told them not to worry about it because he would just pardon them, and so they should go ahead and do it anyways. And that flouting of the rule of law uh, I think is 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 at the core of you know who Trump was across so many issues, right? It wasn't just the Pentagon, it wasn't just the Department of Justice, it wasn't just the Department of Homeland Security. It was sort of fundamental to who he was and how he approached the office. You obtained the resignation letter of Mark Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and he wrote it. He didn't send it, and this was after that notorious uh, Lafayette Square photo op at the church after the square had been cleared of Black Lives Matter protesters. And Millie regretted immediately attending that and in full dress uniform. And I guess, what did the what were the highlights in the letter? And why did he decide to stay in the administration when he saw, you know, what this administration had become? Right. Well, this is one reason we did the book, because I think at the time we had reported that Milley was so upset about what happened that he drafted a letter of resignation he didn't send, but nobody knew what it said. And only in the doing the reporting for this book after Trump left office were we able to actually get a hold of this letter. This is the value of doing books and going back and re-reporting things that happened at the time. And I've never seen, in five, covering five presidents at the White House, any kind of document like this. It was a very full-on full-throated condemnation of his own commander-in-chief. He says, you're doing great and irreparable harm to the country, he said. He said, you're ruining the international order. He said, you don't believe in the values that America fought for in World War II. Really amazing things. People have written pretty blistering letters of resignation before, but nothing like that that I've ever seen with, with a president of the United States. But you're right, he put it in a drawer. Why did he put it in a drawer? Because he decided, like so many others, who worked for Donald Trump, that it meant more if he stayed than if he left, that he could, it was more important for him to stay in order to stop the president from doing things that he considered to be illegal or inappropriate or unethical, but particularly politicizing the military after the election. He saw even as early as the summer of 2020, that there was a real possibility of the president of the United States trying to use the military to stay in office if he lost the election. That's why he stayed. He said, in fact, to his staff, he says, I'm going to stay inside and fight in a remarkable dramatic moment. Well, um, and then that indeed transpired, that there was a crisis after the election on January 6th. Well, that's right. Milley was, um, in fact, you know, at the time you might have thought that he was um, maybe uh, overly paranoid or, uh, you know, sort of certainly among those who were looking at worst case scenarios. But I think that that June 1st 
uh, kind of disastrous Lafayette Square photo op, in a way, it was this kind of early wake up si signal to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the leadership of the Pentagon, which was on high alert uh, for uh, Trump challenging the election, perhaps more so even than the civilians. Milley is a student of history. Uh, he's he's somebody who really spends like all of his spare time, you know, studying World War II and and other uh, military history examples. And he understood, I think, far more clearly than many others in Washington that, uh, you know, the possibility of what the experts call a self-coup was, was real on the part of Donald Trump, that he might seek to stay in power no matter what. And that if you need, if you are trying to do that, you need the support of, uh, you know, what they call in Russia, the power ministries, the, uh, you know, the guys with guns, basically, and that um, it was very important, uh, you know, that that people be on high alert for the signs of that. And I, you know, I have to say, I think we understand now a lot more clearly, even than we did on January 6th, uh, how close we came. Uh, and Donald Trump, uh, it's not crazy paranoid fantasy. Donald Trump had a five-hour meeting in the White House on December 18th, 2020, at which uh, people like Mike Flynn and Sidney Powell were urging him to uh, invoke martial law and to use the Department of Defense to seize voting machines around the country. Obviously, that would have been an unprecedented act. Uh, but imagine if there was a different chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Imagine if the leadership of the Pentagon was not already, uh, you know, extremely worried and alarmed about just this kind of scenario. Uh, and you can see immediately kind of how close we, we might have come. Right. You say that there's always, there seems to be one person standing in just in, in the way of this calamity, be it Mark Milley, um, be it Mike Pence, um, who, whoever else happened to be the, the bulwark. Um, how many people stayed because that's what they thought they were, the one person to prevent catastrophe? Yeah, it was a real through line in our interviews. You know, we did 300 interviews for this book after Trump left office, and people were more willing to share and talk openly about their time in the White House and the administration than they had been, of course, while Trump was still president. That's why, again, you do these kinds of uh, uh, books. And I think that what you found, again, as a theme was all these people coming to their own moral uh, struggles about where the line was, how far beyond which they could not agree to stay? Did their uh, presence make a difference if they did remain? And time and time again, people convince themselves, I have to stay. Because if I don't stay, the person who comes after me will be willing to do all the things I have been resisting and trying to talk the president out of. And you you see evidence of that. I mean, on some level, it's self-justifying, right? People who are ambitious want to stay in big offices with big titles. And you can rationalize anything. Well, I'm really important here. I need to stay. If I don't stay, the whole thing falls apart. But there are instances where you can look at that actually seeming to be the case. And, and January 6th is a great sort of template for figuring that out, right? If if John Kelly, who came to loathe President Trump by the end and had been fighting with him repeatedly during his time there in the White House, had still been chief of staff at the end, he might not have stopped January 6th. But he would have thrown his body in the door of the Oval Office to prevent people like Mike Flynn and Sidney Powell from getting in there and urging martial law, no question about it. Whereas Mark Meadows, who was the last chief of staff, was called the matador by one Republican we interviewed because he was just sort of waving people in. Come on in, anybody who wants to, no matter how crazy or fringe they might be, they get access to the president of the United States. So it makes a difference, we discovered, I think, in doing this book having certain individuals there at certain key moments. Right, but it's also a cautionary tale about the fragility of our institutions. A lot of people sought to comfort themselves with the idea that, well, the institutions held and, you know, as, as, as sort of, uh, disruptive and anxiety producing as it all was that, you know, in the end, uh, you know, the Constitution uh, triumphed and, you know, the individuals, uh, I, you know, the leadership of the Justice Department didn't, uh, you know, uh, launch into a fake investigation of the, you know, false claims of election fraud. But I would say that Trump probed, tested and revealed the weaknesses of so many American institutions, and that in, in, in many ways, that was the through line of the book, was to uh, understand this as a four-year test uh, uh, of a stress test, if you will, of these American institutions. And, 
you know, the way it looks to us, I think, after examining this is that many of those institutions uh, have significant vulnerabilities that have not been addressed to this day, you know, nearly two years after Trump left office, uh, you know, even legislative fixes that could have been made, uh, things like uh, amending the Electoral Count Act, uh, that still has not been passed. And now there's going to be an election in which uh, Republicans may win one, if not both, houses of Congress. So it may never be passed. Uh, and then there's just the idea that if it had just been one different chairman of the Joint Chiefs or the Attorney General uh, had been different, that things actually could have worked out very differently. And I think we can't discount that possibility, which to me, uh, you know, is not a reassuring uh, outcome and is not an indication of the institution's holding. Well, speaking of the attorney general, can you talk about Bill Barr and his role? Because he is really a compromised person when it comes to this idea that he was standing up to Donald Trump, because for most of his tenure, he decidedly was not doing that. He was enabling Donald Trump, especially when it came to the Mueller report. So at what point did you see him turn and say, okay, I, I, I can't do this anymore? And, and, and how would you characterize his, his tenure and his ability to expand this idea of a, an all-powerful power, executive? Yeah, he's an interesting character in that way, and in some ways a case study in how Trump, you know, found people, used people, and ultimately people it, it often turned on him. Basically, I mean, look, if you worked in the Trump White House, you were making a compromise to begin with, unless you were a true believer who really was one of the, you know, true Trumpians. And there were some, obviously. Most of the people in that White House administration were people who were making compromises because they didn't believe in him or because they did think he was erratic or dangerous in some level. And they, they convinced themselves it, meant, it made a difference for them to be there. And Barr is a great example of that, right? And he he did go along. He did facilitate in a lot of ways a lot of things that Trump wanted to be done at the Justice Department. Barr viewed himself as somebody who would defend the Justice Department in some ways against Trump, but went along with him when it came to a lot of the goals. He agreed with Trump on the Russia investigation being illegitimate in his view. This is one of the reasons Trump hired him. He, be, he agreed with Trump on lessening the sentence for Roger Stone, on getting rid of the case against Mike Flynn. We have stories in the book that have never been told before about how he ordered the Justice Department to sue John Bolton, who had been Trump's second, uh, third national security advisor, to stop him from publishing a book that would be damaging to the president, even though he had no, you know, that was, that's a very unusual thing to do. It caused such a consternation of the Justice Department that the assistant attorney general who was in charge of that quit in protest, didn't tell anybody about it, he didn't go public with it, but it was so upset and so outraged by this that he quit. So we have a lot of stories like that, but you're right, in, in, in that post-election period, that's where finally Barr draws a line. Barr says, no, I'm not going along with claiming there's election fraud when there isn't. And, and it's very important that he does. And he has credibility in some ways he does because he had been such a Trumpian figure up until that point. If he had been some less you know, conservative, less seemingly loyal figure, people might've written him off. But in fact, he's the one who gets up and says, I've gone with you for all these things in effect, but this is too much. There's nothing here. He calls it BS. He calls it a lot of other things. Now, you know, does that change the view of what he did before? I mean, as one person we interviewed who worked in that White House said, there are no heroes here. Everybody is a compromised figure and made compromises in order to do what they thought they should do. Barr would tell you he did what he thought was right all along, and he happened to agree with Barr, uh, Trump on a lot of those things and then stood up when he thought Trump was full of it. But, you know, it's a very complicated story with him and I think with all of these people. Yeah, I mean, you get a lot of disingenuousness, I would say, uh, because Donald Trump uh, ultimately ended up breaking with so many of these figures. And, you know, they're often highly opportunistic and certainly misleading at best in their characterizations about Trump once they've broken up with him, right? So Bill Barr is one example. Mitch McConnell is another interesting example. In some ways, you could say our book is sort of a historical rebuttal to their argument that Donald Trump just kind of went crazy after the 2020 election, right? And, and at various points, uh, both Bill Barr and Mitch McConnell have, have made versions of that argument. We quote McConnell in the book, according to our reporting, as basically saying Donald Trump went crazy after uh, the election to the point of uh, derangement was the word that McConnell used with others. Uh, you know, that is a willful misreading 
uh, of uh, Trump's history, right? That that facilitates sort of like basically when I got off the bus, that's when the bus, you know, really got off course. Uh, you know, when it comes to objections in particular about Trump and uh, the rigged election and undermining the system of American elections, well, you know, where was Mitch McConnell and Bill Barr throughout the rest of 2020? Donald Trump's first tweet calling the 2020 election rigged came in the last week of May in 2020. Uh, and in fact, the entire Republican Party, all those campaign operatives, all the people that the January 6th committee has gone to great lengths to show, like in his campaign, how, uh, you know, while we told Trump, you know, that the election wasn't rigged, well, they were uh, totally fine with the president of the United States spending months calling the election rigged with no basis. All of those people, all of those campaign officials, uh, Bill Barr, Mitch McConnell, all of them shown in videotaped testimony by the January 6th committee saying, oh, well, no, you know, there was no rigged election. They, none of them were held accountable for going along with Trump before the election on that. And I think it's just, uh, that's what makes this such an incredible story to tell uh, for us as, as, as journalists and writers, because it's, it's complicated who these characters are. And it's still head scratching that there was a moment where it looked like there was going to be an end to this right after January 6th with Kevin McCarthy outraged and obviously McConnell too, as, as we talked about, even Lindsey Graham had had enough. And that is a lot to have Lindsey Graham say he had had enough of Donald Trump. And yet they, they quick within two weeks, they were back in line supporting him. And is that because they heard from a torrent of their supporters that they weren't going to win re-election if they didn't go back in line with, with Trump, or, or is it just something else? It's something, something kind of this intangible pull that he has over people. He he does, and he is unique in that way. He has survived more scandals, more furors, more things that would have, you know, by far doomed any other politician. And people thought that January sixth would be the end. You're absolutely right. McConnell got up and gave him a blistering speech before the people even entered the Capitol that day. McCarthy afterwards said that the president of the United States bore responsibility privately on phone call. We are told he told the president, you know, you're you can't effing talk to me that way. They had these angry conversations, and yet you're right. They end up back in his corner relatively relatively quickly. Why is that? And, and I think your your point is right. They they se they sensed this the base. Trump had not lost the base. Just 2 days after the riot, the attack on the Capitol, Lindsey Graham is at Reagan National Airport where he's accosted by Trump supporters saying you're a traitor for ba for bailing on Trump. You're a traitor. You know, uh the you know, I interviewed a Republican senator who didn't like Trump, uh but on he wouldn't be on the record. I said, "Well, what's up with that?" And he says, "Look, if you, they did a poll in my state, 88% of Republicans still support him. What do you want me to do? He had more power with their constituents than they did, right? And that they would pay a price. The 10 Republicans in the House who voted to impeach him after January 6th, they're all going to be gone. They were they all ended up retiring or were defeated in primaries or what have you. And everybody else who didn't vote uh, for impeachment saw what happened to them and understood the lesson. Yeah, I mean, one point that I would make is that it wasn't even... Uh, you know, many people think, well, it was, you know, when McCarthy went to Mar-a-Lago uh, two weeks after January 6th. And, you know, certainly that was a big public moment. Uh, but unfortunately, I would say uh, that the possibility of abandoning Trump was never uh, real, even on January 6th itself. Why do I say that? Because uh, literally in the hours after January 6th, when Congress reconvened, uh, two thirds of the House Republican Conference literally walked over the smashed glass of the U.S. Capitol and voted not to certify Joe Biden's election on the same day, not two weeks later, right. uh, you know, but literally on the same day. And that was including Kevin McCarthy, by the way, who had been on the phone with Donald Trump just hours earlier saying, basically, you're trying to kill us. Uh, and you know, that told me, unfortunately, everything. I remember that night so vividly. I'm sure so many of you do as well. Peter and I, of course, were, you know, here. It was in the middle of the pandemic. We were here in our house watching it. And I, I refused to write my New Yorker column uh, early, you know, in the middle of the, the, the thing. And I said, no, I'm going to stay up 
and wait until they bang down the gavel, uh, you know, on this. And, and, and that's when I'll file my column that happened at about 440 in the morning. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, you know, I went back and, and, and reread that not that long ago. And, you know, what I wrote then was, you know, two thirds of the Republicans uh, stuck with the election line, even uh, when this terrible thing has happened in the U.S. Capitol for the first time since the War of 1812. Wow. So you quote one high-ranking official who calls Trump, a like he describes him as a velociraptor in, in Jurassic Park, that he learns to, he learns but as he's attacking his prey, um, he learns to open the door. And I, I'm wondering, should there be a, a Trump second term? What does it look like to you now that you know exactly what the first ter term looked like from in great detail? What does the second term look like to you if there is? Yeah, one? And it's a great analogy that this national security by, uh, official used uh, with, with with Susan doing an interview. And in the, in the, in the point is that Trump may not learn about policy. He probably doesn't know any more about health care today than he did when he got into office or tax codes or whatever. But he does learn how to manipulate the tools of government, the levers of government, just like the velociraptor chasing the kids into the kitchen open that door. And the point of that was to say that in a second term, it would be different. So our book was originally thought of as a work of history in some ways. This captures the four years of his presidency, but it's also maybe potentially a prologue. And I think if you look at our book and all the things he wanted to do, but couldn't do because he was frustrated, because he couldn't figure out how to do it, because there was resistance, because his own advisors talked him out of it, there's not going to be nearly as much resistance inside his White House next time around. He's not going to surround himself with people who don't agree with him, like John Kelly and Jim Mattis and H.R. McMaster and all of these people who stood up to him and said, no, that's not right. So when he wanted to get out of NATO, which he wanted very much to do in his first term and was talked out of it, who knows that he wouldn't do it in his second term. When he talked about pulling all U.S. troops home from South Korea, which would have destabilized a lot of people felt uh, Asia uh, and was talked out of it. No, you know, that's something he could do in a second term because he wouldn't be surrounded by the same people who said no. Even things like closing the border, which again, people would tell you are, is illegal to do. Uh, even this idea of martial law over an election he lost. Uh, imagine if he had a complete reign and didn't have an attorney general and a, uh, you know, and a, and a, and a, you know, other people who are telling him no, a vice president who says, no, I can't take that power for myself. Imagine if he doesn't have those people in a second term, he's gonna have a much freer hand. So anything you see in our book, that he tried to do in his first term that you find interesting or you know interesting. controversial, then you should assume he's going to try to do it in a second term and have a freer hand. You met with him a couple of times. You went down to Mar-a-Lago. Did he say, did he indicate to you, do you think he will definitely run? Well, you know, it's interesting. We had these two uh, interviews with Trump in April of 2021, and then seven months later in November of 2021. So I would say, if anything, he's become more likely to run since we met with him then, uh, in, in part because he seems to view uh, running for office and being a candidate as a potential sort of uh, protection to him against the possibility of indictment by the Justice Department. Uh, and certainly his legal troubles in that regard seem to be closing in more on him and in, in a weird way may make him more likely. Also just, you know, what we know, of course, about Donald Trump's personality is that he's hardly somebody who is capable of leaving the scene gracefully. And the idea that he's simply going to leave the Republican field uh, to be uh, taken up by one of the people that he sees as, uh, you know, sort of usurping Trumpism, uh, look at his friction that he already has with Ron DeSantis. He's already publicly complained a couple of times. Well, I made him. Uh, and actually, there's something to be said for that. Uh, it, people may forget, but in 2018, when DeSantis was a, basically a relatively obscure Republican House member, he ran in a contested Republican primary to be governor of Florida. And he was not winning that primary until he turned into uh, a campaign that was focused on being the most uh, faithful Trumpist in the lot. And he ran a campaign ad in which he put his little baby son in a uh, Make America Great Again onesie. And he was shown reading a book to his toddler daughter, uh, How to Build the Wall. 
and you know his whole appeal as a, as a political candidate and that's why he won the Republican primary and then why he won the governorship was to be the most Trumpy candidate. So I just, you know, Donald Trump is not somebody who is just going to gracefully go into the good night, uh, I'm, I'm afraid to say. <laughs> okay, we have lots and lots of questions. It's that time where we go to the list to the viewer questions and listener questions. So I'll uh, pick a few of them. Uh, here is Jill asking, is the media complicit in Trump's continued success by continuing to write and talk about him? Well, it's a great question. One we've wrestled with, obviously, you know, I think that there was an initial inclination after he left office to not cover him as much to say, OK, we don't need to to give him a lot of space, a lot of airtime, all that kind of stuff. But the truth is, pretending he's not there doesn't mean he's not there. And just because The New York Times, for instance, was not going to cover him doesn't mean that he's not out there controlling the Republican Party. And it would be derelict of a, of a news organization to pretend that Trump is not a major figure in our country. In fact, it should be the opposite. We should make sure we are covering him with a great deal of intensity so that we are scrutinizing the things that he is doing and making sure our readers know about that. With all these investigations, there's no way we could not cover President Trump or former President Trump. For heaven's sakes, I imagine a former president with, I think it's six different major investigations going on, and we were going to say we're not going to cover that. So I, I, I get the, the question, and I think it's an interesting point. I think you have seen cable news change their approach, for instance. They don't carry his cable, his, his rallies live and give him, you know, unedited, uh, you know, uh, free airtime in that sense. But broadly speaking, I think the media should be covering him pretty aggressively. Do you cover him differently now than you did four years ago, five years ago, hmm. six years ago? Well, I mean, it is interesting, isn't it, uh, to see the difference uh, in Trump and the news cycle now that he's been banned from Twitter. Uh, and I do think that his kind of daily stream of pronouncements uh, tend to get much less coverage now. But I will say that it's very likely to change uh, if and when he becomes a candidate for president again. Uh, and I do think that we will see uh, an increase in that kind of coverage uh, once the prospect of him returning to power, uh, if that were to become far more real uh, and pressing, then I think you would see a, a commensurate increase in the amount of scrutiny that was being given to those uh, daily and hourly even pronouncements by Donald Trump. So, you know, I think that, the, the, you know, coverage, news coverage ebbs and flows uh, based on its uh, significance, but uh, Trump's pronouncements have remained significant. For example, uh, in the early stage of the Ukraine war back in February, right, he 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 did say uh, that Donald that Vladimir Putin was a quote strategic genius for invading Ukraine when he thought uh, Putin was going to win. Uh, he came out publicly and opposed the um, massive forty billion dollar aid package uh, that Congress approved uh, this spring for Ukraine. And basically on the heels of that pronouncement, uh, which passed overwhelmingly, but there were something like 87 House Republicans who voted against uh, that, including two thirds of the Freedom Caucus, which is sort of the, the group of the far right group in the House that's become kind of the leading uh, focal point of uh, the Trumpists in the Republican Party. And you know that's Trump leading uh, them on a very significant break with it, with their own party's uh, uh, kind of like uh, foreign policy uh, ideology. And I think it's an indicator of why he needs to be aggressively covered. Uh, okay, oh, so many questions. Um, blah, 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 blah. Oh, uh, let's see. Ralph asks, and I'm curious about this. How did you write this book as a couple? What is your methodology? Do you take one chapter each or how does that work? <laughs> well, we <laughs> this is our third book together. So we've, we've got it down, hopefully, by now. And we actually met in the newsroom of the Washington Post back 23 years ago when Susan was my editor and I was a reporter. So we, we worked together from the beginning and, and figured out how to make that work. But you're right. Yeah, as a matter of, of logistics, we did come up with a table of contents and divide up the 30 chapters or whatever it is. And you do that one, I'll do this one. And then we pass them back and forth. And while we have very different writing styles, I think in a lot of ways, by the time we edit and rewrite and go back and forth, they it kind of smooths it out to so this sort of a single voice, I think. And most people would would look at the book, I, I think, and couldn't tell which parts mine and which parts yours, do you think? 
Well, we'll see. I don't know. Uh, you, know you can you can read this and uh, and tell us yourself. But <laughs> you know, it's uh, we're very lucky to have the chance to work together. What I would say, I know a lot of people say, well, how could you possibly write a book with your you know your husband or your wife? Well, you know, in some ways, it's such an all consuming thing uh, to do a project like this. And this was a very heavy lift, even compared with the two previous books that we've done together, because it was a very ambitious project to do in this amount of time. And to me, it's like, if, if one person is going to be immersed in a project like that, uh, you know, from my perspective, better that we, we both should be, because otherwise, uh, you know, it would be a, a huge uh, pull away from you know, our, our family, (laughs) it really was uh, a very ambitious project. How long did you, would you spend all day working on it? Because you also, yeah, I was down all night. I mean, you know, and and Peter has better, uh, uh, tolerance than I do at this point for, you know, not getting any sleep. Uh, we, we actually did pull a couple of like genuine, uh, the kind you haven't had since college all nighters to finish this book, uh, which for me <laughs> was really <laughs> difficult, but um, a sign of how much we were really on deadline. Sam asks, you have done hundreds of interviews uh, of those who served Trump. Clearly, folks are willing to criticize Trump after his term. How do you explain their silence for four years? Well, I mean, that's an important question. And then a lot of them, some of them were willing to come out during his presidency. Let's not forget that. But you're right that the, most of the key characters, uh, most of the top figures, the cabinet officers uh, remain relatively quiet. From time to time, they might put out a statement, you know, as Jim Mattis did after, you know, Jan- after January 6th, after uh, the Lafayette Square, you know, moments like that. But for the most part, they didn't speak out. You know, there were a junior, a younger cohort of people who did break with the president and tried to make a, a concerted effort in the 2020 election to, to, to get their support, uh, their superiors, their cabinet secretaries to jointly talk to the public and they refused to do it. Part of it, I think, was a sense of, you know, intimidation. Trump has a way of intimidating people. Uh, they thought that some people thought it wouldn't be heard, that they would just be dismissed as disgruntled former uh, you know, officers and therefore not listened to anyway. And uh, and some, I think, uh, you know, were torn about what to, what to do. But once he left office, they 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 definitely felt freer. Now, in other presidencies, and I've done other books, we've done other books in other presidencies. That's also true. Even the ones where they're not disgruntled with the president that they work for, people are freer to talk after they leave office. But it was very striking how many people felt uh, strongly that he was a dangerous or reckless figure, but weren't willing to say it while he was still in office. And how many were willing to go on the record? Well, most of our interviews are done on background in order to, you know, secure their cooperation. We had to obviously keep in mind that the number of them were trying to, you know, cleanse their reputations, if you will. We didn't take them at face value. You had to confirm with other people who were in the room and, and be, you know, keep a jaundiced eye about anybody who was saying, oh, I really stood up to them when when the push came to shove. You got to be careful about that kind of thing. But, you know, we, we tried to do it. Uh, mostly on background in order to try to get a fuller account of everything, but you, you can judge from your from yourself uh, who you think talked and didn't. Okay, I want to end on a somewhat light note, if, mm-hmm. if you don't mind. Um, there's there's so much seriousness in this book, and it's very important to read it to understand where we're going, where we were, where we're going. But there are also a lot of really funny anecdotes, and I'm wondering if you could each pick your favorites. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite? Oh my goodness. Uh, you know, there, I don't know if you would call it funny or not, but I do think there's this, there's this great scene that hadn't been reported before, uh, from the last face-to-face meeting that Donald Trump had with Vladimir Putin. And they're on the sidelines of, um, uh, uh, G20 summit meeting. And, uh, you know, Donald Trump is kind of like strutting in and he's, you know, being all cocky and he's bragging, to uh, uh, Putin as he does. And he's like, oh, you know, they love me so much, Vladimir in Poland, they're gonna name Fort Trump after me. And in uh, Israel, they love me so much. They're gonna name Trump Heights after me, uh, you know, and uh, Putin just totally has Trump's number. <laughs> he says, well, Donald, you know, maybe they should just name all of Israel 
after you. <laughs> and I just, I love that scene because it just shows you that like, it's a one-way love affair, right? It's Donald Trump sucking up to Vladimir Putin who just is having none of it. And I mean, it's, it's not that funny when you think about the consequences, but it, okay. it really is kind of funny. And of course, Donald Trump, like a lot of narcissistic self-absorbed people, like he doesn't get the joke, right? He's not a guy. I thought it was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> no one loves the Jews more than he, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and speaking of that as a story, when they had the Abraham Accord, which is one of the bigger, more important things that happens uh, during his presidency, they wanted to have a signing ceremony on the South Lawn that was really important to Trump. They had to have a big signing ceremony on the South Lawn, like Clinton did with the Oslo Accords or Carter with Camp David. Except the problem was the First Lady wouldn't let him do it. Why wouldn't the first lady let him do it? Because she had just resodded the lawn after the Republican convention and she didn't want them to mess up the grass. And so here you had the situation where they were trying to solve one of the biggest geopolitical turf battles in history. And they literally couldn't do it because they couldn't, because the turf, the actual turf uh, at the White House. So finally, Jared Kushner is all frustrated by this and says, uh, well, how much does it cost to resod the lawn anyway? And they said, well, $80,000. He says, fine, I'll pay for it. If they mess up the lawn, it's on me. I'm going to pay for it. <laughs> And that's the kind of thing that they were constantly dealing with. There's so many, you know, internal struggles and fights, and some of them are funny, and some of them are, are, are dysfunctional and crazy, and some of them are, are sad and pathetic. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, that's that's some of the uh, through line, I think, also through the book. Well, it is really a fantastic undertaking, and congratulations on the book. Um, 700 pages. Plus? Really low. It's like don't count the notes. If you don't count the notes, nobody reads the notes. It's more like six hundred and some. It's a quick read. Very it's quick. a quick read. It is, and also a great listen. I listened also on the, as an audiobook. Yeah. So a great narrator. Yeah. So thank you so much. Thanks for being back with us again, and hopefully we'll see you again soon. And good luck on the rest of your book tour. Thank you so thank much. This you. is a great conversation. Hope you feel better. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and don't forget. Next week, uh, join Pat Morrison as she interviews William Bratton and Michael Moore, former LA police chiefs. They're going to talk about crime in America, fact versus fiction. Same place, same time, different topic, but as fascinating, I'm sure. So join us then. I'm Madeline Brand, and I will see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>